Hello and welcome to the Total Entertainment Podcast with me, Paul Collis. And today we're going to take a look at Gregory Porter. So before I get on to his background, let's take a look at what kit he has. Now, this show was built very quickly and efficiently and was up and in the air and uh, even test and testing all the equipment before I even stepped foot in the building. So it's a two truck show and it's a very simple theatre style setup. You have two lighting bars, which is front of house one, and that is above the first couple of rows of uh, audience pointing on stage, which is a handful of moving light profiles and washers. The uh, washers to give a nice little general wash, and the profiles I would assume to uh, night to isolate certain sections of the stage, such as the uh, drum riser or the piano riser etc etc then you have LX1 which is the back bar which is pointing on stage and giving a nice backwash effect you have a red theatre style drape which is basically a red pleated drape it doesn't come across or anything and it's there to look very very nice and pretty you've got some floor moving un- moving like units which appear to be some profile led profile units which means they can change the gobos to give it give the backdrop a nice little uh, change of shape and even color and you have some practical lights which are some static lights and stands with a uh, nice gobo projection on there so it's just there for aesthetics it looks good to look at and if you look at the uh, beams of lights when it hits a, when it hits a smoke effect then it breaks up the stage a little bit better as well and you have some floor units downstage left and downstage right to give a nice little bit of cross light where gravity portal would pr- predominantly be the sound system you have line arrays which are one wide and 14 deep and you have a smaller line array set back at 45 degrees to give the surround sound effect. Bass wise you have a few uh, floor units that are stacked stage left and stage right and you also have six front fills pointing directly into the audience. A nice little bit of sound from that sound system and with a bit of luck you'd get the 22 carat clarity which fingers crossed you would do on this kind of show it's not going to be that powerful in the sense of bass or or some real larry high frequencies it's a theatre style show and when i say theatre style show it's going to be nice and laid back and out there to for everyone to sit back and enjoy the music Right, we're going to get on to some of the background, but we'll be back after this. So not only does Master X Media have a series of podcasts, but we also have a series of books. The first book is actually two books, it's volume one and volume two, of a tribute to working at sea. The best fiction is based on truth. This is a compilation of short stories, rants and poems loosely based on the author's experience at working on a cruise ship. Some of these stories are based on actual events but highly exaggerated, whilst other stories are pure fiction. The title of the book A Tribute To is fitting with the tone of the book because, like a tribute act, it is a blatant altered reality where you can enjoy it knowing it's not quite the truth. There are things of alcoholism which used to be highly prevalent within workers in the cruise industry as well as stories with a sexual nature. So sit down, relax and enjoy the ride of A Tribute to Working at Sea Volumes 1 and 2. All of these books are available on Amazon and are available in paperback and on Kindle and the links for all these books are in the description below. Gregory Porter was born in Sacramento, California and was raised in Bakersfield, California where his mother, Ruth, was a minister. Porter has seven siblings. His mother was a large influence on his life having encouraged him to sing in church at an early age. His father, Rufus, was largely absent from his life. 
says Porter. Everybody had some issues with their father. Even if he was in the house, he may have just been emotionally absent. My father was just straight up absent. I hung out with him just a few days in my life, and it wasn't a long time. He just didn't seem to be completely interested in being there. Maybe he was, I don't know. A 1989 graduate of Highland High School, he received a full athletic scholarship as a football lineman to San Diego State University, but a shoulder injury during his junior year cut short his football career. Porter's mother died from cancer when he was 21 years old. From her deathbed, she pleaded with him, sing baby, sing. Porter moved to the Bedford Stew Versant section of Brooklyn in 2004, along with his brother Lloyd. He worked as a chef at Lloyd's restaurant, Bread Stew, now defunct, where he also performed. Porter performed at other neighbourhood venues, including Sister's Place and Solomon's Porch, and moved on to a Harlem club called St Nick's Pub, where he maintained a weekly residency. Out of this residency evolved what would become Porter's touring band. Porter released two albums on the Mortimer label together with Member and Entertainment Group, 2010's Walter and 2012's Be Good before signing with Blue Notes Records under Universal Music Group. On May 17, 2013, his third album, Liquid Spirit, was released on September 2, 2013 in Europe and on September 17th of 2013 in the US. The album produced by Ryan Bacharus won the 2014 Grammy for Best Jazz Vocal Album. Liquid Spirit enjoyed commercial success rarely achieved by albums in the jazz genre, reaching the top 10 on UK Albums Chart. It was certified gold here by the BPI, selling over 100,000 units in the UK. In August 2014, Porter released The In Crowd as a single. On May 9th, 2015, Porter participated in VE Day 70, A Party to Remember, a televised commemorative concert from Horse Guards Parade in London, singing As Time Goes By. His fourth album, Take Me to the Alley, was released on May 6th, 2016, and it was labelled Album of the Week by The Guardian. On June 26th, 2016, Porter performed on the Pyramid stage at Glastonbury Festival. Writing for the Daily Telegraph, Neil McCormick said, Portly, middle-aged jazzer may be the oldest pop star on the planet, but is a refreshing testament to the notion that most important organ for musical appreciation should always be our ears. And Porter has one of the most easy on the ear voices in popular music, a creamy baritone that flows thick and smooth across a rich gatto of juicy melody. It's a voice that makes you want to lick your lips and dive right in. In September 2016, Porter performed at Ray J2's Live in Hyde Park from Hyde Park, London. He would go on to perform in the annual BBC Children's Need Show in November, a night dedicated to Sir Terry Wogan, who hosted it in previous years and was, the fa was a fan of uh, Porter. In January 2017, Porter performed the song Holding On on BBC One's The Grey and Norton Show. In September 2017, he performed as part of Later with Jules Holland, Later 25 concert in the Royal Albert Hall. In October 2017, he performed the song Mona Lisa with Jeff Goldblum on piano in the Graham Norton Show. On August 28, 2020, Porter released his sixth studio album, All Rise. On the 5th of November 2021, Porter released a Greatest Hits compilation album titled Still Rising, the collection on the Blue Notes label. The same day, he performed the song Revival on the Graham Norton Show. On New Year's Eve 2021, Porter performed on Jules Holland's Hootenanny, which I actually watched that actually. That was a good performance. And I got my missus to watch it and she doesn't normally watch stuff like that. And she totally enjoyed it as well. Anyways, moving on. Describing his own style, Porter said in a 2014 interview, I would say Donny Hathaway, Nat King Cole, Bill Weathers, I hear something of me in all of them that is similar to the culture that I grew up in, i.e. gospel music. I could hear the familiarity to gospel music in the songs of someone like Ray Charles, just voices that influence my soul and are rooted in gospel music. For public appearances, Paul always wears a hat reminiscent of a deer stalker incorporating fabric that covers his ears and chin. In a 2012 interview with jazzweekly.com, when asked, What's with the weird and wonderful hat? Porter replied, I've had some surgery on my skin, so this has been my look for a little while and will continue to be for a while longer. 
people recognise me by it now. It is what it is. In an interview with the Daily Telegraph in 2016, he divulged that he received some facial scars when he was 7 or 8, but declined to go into specifics of how they were sustained. He said, I saw it one day, the hat, and said, I'm going to put this on. I like it, and was before the music career. The cap is a Kangol summer spitfire. A tribute to men that hate their jobs is a brutal but witty portrayal of working a job you hate. In this podcast, there are themes explored in which happy workers simply wouldn't understand unless they listen to these cautionary tales from a man that lost his ideal job because of the global pandemic. Be warned that this podcast contains strong, offensive language that some listeners may not want to hear. In addition, this podcast is definitely not recommended for younger audiences. The links for this is in the description below. And we're back. So, I haven't been able to find out much information on Lady Blackbird. So, I went to her webpage and looked at her about tab and this is what it reads. No place big enough for holding all the tears you're going to cry because your mama's name was lonely and your daddy's name was pain. And they call you little sorrow because you'll never love again. Why you're going to fly, Blackbird... You ain't ever gonna fly. Blackbird. Nina Simone Herbert Sacker in 1963. Lady Blackbird didn't mean to soundtrack a revolution, but last spring, that's exactly what she did. On the 27th of May 2020, the Los Angeles-based singer Marley Monroe released her debut single. It's a brave soul indeed who not only tackles one of Nina Simone's starkest tunes, Blackbird, but also calls herself Lady Blackbird into the bargain, notably and sold at the time. The original is a stripped down chant with claps and hand drums, a field hollering protest song that will darken the skies of anyone's heart. Lady Blackbird has the same urgent grace as Simone and she really takes what is an essentially a cappella song and adds her own powerful magic and spirit to proceedings. She channels the agony and thick despair to the lyrics too. Simone released Blackbird in 1963 at the height of the civil rights struggle. Almost six decades later, the killing of George Floyd, two days before the release of Lady Blackbird's version, gave this new rendition a coincidental but no less stark, awful, yet uplifting power. There was so much emotion there, Lady Blackbird reflects now of a recording she and her Grammy-nominated producer Chris Seffried had laid down in the legendary Studio 3, aka Prince's Room, in LA's Sunset Sound. Jazz, she agrees, has protest in its DNA. Ultimately, I'm in this to entertain, not to be any sort of leader. That's a huge responsibility that's too deep within itself. I want to entertain and push people's buttons. But having that platform, having people willing to listen to you and your music, that's a responsibility. And one of using that opportunity to share your views. As it happens, in actual fact, they'd recorded Blackbird a few months previously. But unfortunately and disgustingly, it did ring so fucking true last spring. She continues with a hint of the soulful fierceness that, on stage, makes Lady Blackbird a wonder to behold. It's always been one of my favourite songs of hers. I'd listen to Blackbird on repeat on my headphones for hours at a time, just feeling it, getting into the bones of it. I could picture myself singing it on stage. I often do that, close my eyes, imagine me interpreting certain songs on stage, and I thought, this song has to be done. Lady Blackbird isn't the Nina Simone of the Black Lives Matter era. She certainly wouldn't call herself that. But she is the talent and a force of nature and the talk-walking personality that Giles Peterson has dubbed the Grace Jones of Jazz, an accolade reinforced by the remixes of recent single College by Jazz and House heavyweights Bruce, Greg, Fote and KDA. 
and she's the woman who can flex in other areas too. A scene in the jaw-dropping version of, of Tom Petty's Angel Dream that she performed at the virtual birthday bash held last October in tribute to what would have been the late musician's 70th birthday. We can also just call her the best new voice of 2021, a transcendent performer of songs old and new, an artist whose approach, outlook and vibe is summed up in the title of her stunning forthcoming debut album, Black Acid Soul. Minimal yet rich, classic yet timely, the album connects backwards to Miles Davids, his pianist Darren Johnson plays Steinway Baby Grand, Mellotron and, and Cache Synth throughout, and forwards to Pete Tong, he made, he made the bruise mix of Collage, his number two essential selection tune of 2020, and yes, Victoria Beckham, Matthew Herbert's remix of second single Beware the Stranger sound, soundtrack to the Designer Spring Summer 2020 fashion show. Its 11 tracks have a sound feeling and attitude that speaks of Lady Blackbird's deep experience in music stretching all the way back to infancy. I don't ever remember not singing, she says, recording performances in church and at fairs from the age of five. It wasn't I knew how to do and don't want to be and don't want to do anything else. By her early teens, Lady Blackbird was travelling to and from Nashville. She was signed to a Christian label, but the only music that resulted was some work with rock rap group DC Talk. After they split, she worked with former member Toby Mac, appearing on his first four solo albums and touring together. I realised that that whole Christian world, which my parents tried to place me in, was so goddamn far from who I was. I did not want to do Christian music. I didn't believe anything of what they did and I quit the tour. A wise young soul already at the age of 16, she then found herself in limbo because I was in this contract till I was 18. Oh my god, I hate when that happens. You know, you, uh, you see it all the time where, uh, where artists are just trapped by a signature. Anyways, let's continue. Legally, once an adult and free, she based herself out of New York whilst flying to and from sessions in LA. She was working with Jimmy Jam, Terry Lewis, Sam Watters, Louis Banicello, Trixie Stewart and the Heavyweights. A production deal led to a record deal with Reed's Epic, but creative differences led to her parting ways with the label. So the deal ended and I was and it was back to the drawing board and working with different people. One of those was artist turned writer and producer Seth Reed, who'd been Grammy nominated for his work on the debut album by Andrea Day, soon to be seen as Billy Holiday in Biopic The United States vs Billy Holiday. On meeting Lady Blackbird, he recalls thinking, Wow, I'm working with the best new vocalists that there are. Andrea and Lady Blackbird are two of the greatest singers on the planet. From Lady Blackbird's point of view, I f***ing loved his shit. She who she hates. Relieved to have finally found a musical partner who got her. Chris listened to me, asking if I was feeling this vibe or that vibe. He was able to dig inside what I was feeling. Next thing you know, he had some amazing sounds worked out. We really just connected. They took their time working in Seraphid's LA studio, feeling out the bespoke musical path that would work with the fiercely individual performer. Finally, in hitting on the idea of stripping everything back, we cracked the code. I'd written a song, Nobody's Sweetheart, a jazz ballad kind of thing, and asked her to do a vocal, explains Seth Reed. I laid the tune on her, and, she, and it's quite a complicated piece of music. Then I played it again, and she goes, okay, I got it. And in two takes, she nailed it live. It's a real natural genius kind of thing to have that kind of masculinity intuitively. That song, when he began playing it to, uh, when he began playing it to people, stopped them in their tracks. In fact, when I played it to my therapist, he started crying. When you break the therapist, that's when you know you're winning, Lady Blackbird laughs. A sad, elegantly simple tune, Nobody's Sweetheart was too a Pathfinder song, and also the first one they recorded with ultimately on the finished album, a beautiful trumpet solo from the great New Orleans virtuoso 
Troy, trombone Shorty Andrews. After working on big pop bangers, this was the mother load. After going all out, they were going all in, deeply in, getting out of the way and letting shine the voice of Lady Blackbird. Fuller Singer, a proud member of the LGBTQ plus community, that approach however didn't, couldn't diminish her onstage persona. I love my over the top costumes and all this elaborate shit on stage, Chris convinced me we could be a ja- we could be jazz and still keep that attitude. Suffice to say that, when Seth Rude played Nobody's Sweetheart to Ross Allen, the British label exec, DJ and, cre- and crate digger, who signed Lady Blackbird to his new imprint, Foundation Music. He was astounded. I also showed him this picture of her, this radical woman on stage, and it was from the back, wearing this incredible dress and patty label headgear. Ross was like, she sings like that and looks like that. Fucking hell. Yeah, it was my ass, she shouts, delighted. Our ass, ass out always. You can hear that personality in collage, an instant earworm, which she inhabits in multiple colours. It's Lady Blackbird's take on the fucking quirky James Gang original, a soulful psych rock deep cut from 1969. There's more inspired reinvention, The Aching It Will Never Happen Again, written by Tom Harden, and which first appeared in the folk singer's ceremonial 1966 debut. Forthright as ever, Lady admits, that one was of the ones I didn't like at first. It wasn't boring, I just didn't know how to give it some power or personality at first, but then I tried it, it was beautiful, it was a beautiful session, ended up one of my favourites on the album, it just sounds magical. That spirit of adventure and invention is there too, on Beware the Stranger. It's a re-rub of Wanted Dead or Alive, a rare groove classic recorded by Funk Gospel Collective Voices of East Harlem in 1973 and co-produced by Curtis Mayfield. This is Black Acid Soul, and this is the first crucial album of 2021. Are you ready to fly with Lady Blackbird? Now that just seems very, very interesting. And uh, I'm very intrigued by uh, what I've just seen. We'll be back after this. The name's Vert, Percival Reginald Vert, and I run the PR Vert Detective Agency. The year is 2055 and the police have been defunded. So if you need a police investigation, the police will charge you a thousand big ones a day. Because of this, the government introduced the PI Act, where the private investigators can undercut the police so justice can become affordable. These are my case files. Percival Vert is no hero. He is a low-life scumbag and the full embodiment of how not to be a man. He cheats his way into getting work, he objectifies women and is quite a disgusting human being, if you can even call him that. Gumshoe is intended to poke fun at everyone that takes life too seriously and directly towel whips the modern day Puritans in the balls because they have forgotten the fact that when something isn't funny in real life, it's probably hilarious in the land of fiction. Come and listen to Gumshoe every Wednesday. The links are in the description below. And we're back. So Lady Blackbird, she came on in a nice Congo and still blue wash. And she was dressed in such a flamboyant showgirl kind of uh, way. So we're talking about black leotard, boots and um, arm capes. So if you don't know what arm cape is, it's the bits of uh, fabric that go from your arm and connect at your back and fans out very nicely indeed. So very flamboyant and I wasn't quite expecting that to be honest. <laughs> Anyways, so she come out in her flamboyant get up in that wash in the Congo blue and steel blue wash and then as soon as the bass guitar dropped she then began to sing and the uh, and the lights change in a nice warm amber and Congo blue mix. There were no follow spots for her set, so she just quite literally had the face light from the front of the house LX bar. Pretty yet basic and straightforward lighting. And yeah, you had the back lights lighting the pools of uh, downstage area of the stage. And two of these at back lights were uh, pointed 45 degrees into the down center stage where she was standing and you had two 
of the front house lights pointing directly onto uh, her onto her standing mark and then you had the rest of the front house units on a lower level but lighting the rest of her bound very straightforward lighting and from song to song it was just a different color change and it was always a two-tone color and all complementary colors either a bright state for a upbeat song or a darker state for a downbeat song and oh my god her sound was amazing we had 22 karat clarity coming from the sound mix and it was a really really good mix i have to say so band wise she had her pianist she had a bass player and rhythm guitar and that was it and basically those instruments were complementing her vocal ability so her vocal ability is in place of most of an orchestra that's how strong her vocals were and the amount of sass and emotion that she put into her vocals it just came across as full bodied as the rest of the band and it worked really really well so for her whole performance Lady Blackbird remained rooted onto that down centre stage spot she had a little bit of movement in her from left to right a little bit backing off a little bit when to an instrumental section and then she'll come back into the main pool of light and what I did notice which is very clever on her part I have to say when a musician took an instrumental solo she could subtly draw the audience focus from her onto the musician by just slightly turning towards them and gesturing with her hand and the focus moved from her straight onto the band member and it worked really well it's a very subtle thing to do because it wasn't a big movement it was just a slight turn and a small hand gesture and the audience's focus shifted from her to uh, the band member in question and something like that would take a lot of practice and that's a really good skill to learn especially if you're up and coming in the industry which lady blackbird is and she already mastered the subtleties of focus before she even made it big which is really really good really good going actually her musical arrangements are quite minimalistic which is not a bad thing because yet again her vocals take the precedence over the instruments the instruments are just supplementing her vocal ability and you had some intricacies on every instrument and when the uh, intricacies come on you then had uh, the rest of the instruments taking a little back line so the beat just dropping down slowly and behind the instrument that's uh, doing a real in for example with the guitar doing an intricate pick around the chord structures same with the bass and then uh, same with the piano as well so all these little subtle intricacies and her musical arrangements are just perfect from someone who's really unknown to me that is obviously um, she's got people she's built a massive following uh, since she started and she's only only going to get bigger and bigger lady blackbird left a massive massive impression on me and she definitely left that massive impression on the audience because the audience was so captivated by her after every song she had a massive round of applause and they were cheering her on during the song as well and her interaction with uh, command in the band and the audience for example on her first song she she raised her hand ready to just to show the audience that she was about to carry on when she was paused and at that point you get a lot of people who would clap and applause and when they notice her hand going up the applause died down for her to do a massive strong vocal finish and the song fin and then the song finished the way how it should have it's just pure class skills like that is so hard to learn it takes practice dedication and she had she must have had some excellent tuition from people within the industry to be able to command that as well to be able to have that stage presence where she uses the subtleties so well that people don't even know that they've picked up on it until they've picked up on it which is really good and what can I say 
Her vocal ability, jeez. She has such a superior and a full bodied vocal range. It was intimidatingly amazing. And I wish her the best of luck for a long career because she's gonna have a long lasting career. That I guarantee. And I look forward to her next album. And in fact, I'm gonna buy her uh, first album as soon as I get home, or probably, or probably first thing tomorrow morning. Because, wow. Yeah, as I said, she's left such a lasting impression on me. I want more. I really want more. And I'm sure that Lady Blackbird left the audience wanting more as well. Lady Blackbird is definitely not an artist to be missed, especially if you love this kind of music. The, the intricate, small, minimalistic, but powerful jazz sessions. And that was a jazz session and it worked really, really well. I applaud Lady Blackbird, I really do. We'll be back after this. Thank you for listening to today's podcast. If you've liked today's podcast, please hit like, subscribe and share. And if you haven't already done so, why not check out more content from Master X Media on our website, www.masterxmedia.info. And we'll catch you next time. Bye for now. 30 Years Since is a sci-fi story podcast which is full of dramatical moments and a bit of gratuitous violence. The first series was originally done in first person. So it, the character is just telling a monologue. And then the second series and onwards became more third person. So it was more of an in-depth story. And uh, you have all the characters actually interacting with each other. Great set of sci-fi stories. So, 30 years after an alien invasion, which uh, the humans lost, and the first story arc is now over, though we've got plenty more story arcs left to tell from the land of 30 years since. So why not check it out, the links are in the description below. And we're back, so Gregory Porter. The band came out to a preset of Congo Blue and as the house lights went down, the band were then moved into position and as soon as the band started up, the lights faded from Congo Blue to an amber wash. And then as Gregory Porter come out, the stage just flooded with magenta and amber lights. And it looked pretty amazing actually. Now, for the whole of the show, the lighting designer followed the age-old rule of less is more. Just because a moving light can move doesn't mean it needs to. And when you see a sh when you go from shows where you've got flash and trash and lights whirling all over the place, to then contrast it to a show like this, it is very much appreciated because, yet yeah, again, less is more. You don't just because a moving light can move doesn't mean it needs to move. The whole point of them when they first designed the moving light is so you can have less lights up in the rig because those lights can move position to where they need to need to be rather than having 10 lights to do the job of one. It's just a modern concept that people just move it around because they can. The lighting designer kept it very very much old school and when I say old school it's a cabaret jazz style which is very dark and deep and uh, even with the color even when you've got bright colors as well it just keeps it nice and deep and full bodied and static because you don't need a show like this to be full of whirling lights and these static states were very very well designed you had shapes within the lights just kept static so you had the uh, profiles on the uh, backlight on the backlighting bar, say LX1, because it was only two lighting bars. So the profiles in that bar were making 45 degree shapes, mirroring the other side of the stage and whatnot. And then you had the washes that were flooding the stage as well with different colours. Then you had the floor units that at the back of the stage, giving a bit of up light. And you had the practical uh, lamps as well, which were converted to being LED, so they could be any colour as well and 
the static states looked amazing and every song you had a different combination of colour and every combination of colour just looked very complimentary of each co- of each colour you never had a colour clash and it looked very very sweet it really did and Gregory Porter was pretty much picked up by by follow spots as well throughout the show the only time he wasn't lit by follow spot was a subtle intricacy so when there for example there was a musical solo the follow spot would fade off of that Gregory Porter and that allowed the focus go from from Gregory Porter onto the band member doing the solo and yet yeah, it works really really well so just like Lady uh, Blackbird who uh, did the subtle hand movements and uh, the slight turns towards the towards the uh, soloist Gregory Porter whose show it was had the follow spots do that job for him but he still used hand gestures he still turned towards the uh, band member and when he went singing on these solos he was definitely rocking to the beat as well you know feeling every moment of that song and it looked really good you don't need to have the face light to see that he was enjoying that solo and every solo that he, that was played he definitely enjoyed that and it came across really well when you're looking at that i love that about artists who they're there and they really feel the music that's being played great effect to be in the audience to see something like that sound wise yet again we had the 22 karat gold standard and the sound engineer had a flawless mix and balance between all the instruments and there were quite a few instruments on stage and the and Gregory Porter's vocals you could hear absolutely everything that was going through that PA system every uh, instrument and all the vocals and the backing vocals all mixed perfectly so there wasn't a mishmash you could hear every individual line of track and when I say line of track it's each instrument clearly you could sit you could hear it if you had a look at the sound desk and you uh, sample it you would see every single wavelength in the same way how you would hear it that's how that's how clear that sound mix was very very talented sound engineer that and what can I say about the band they were all at the top of their game every band member on it perfect and flawlessly and they were moving around with the uh, instruments and feeling that music and you could see that, that how they're feeling that music from where they're playing that by the way how they were interacting with each other with the movements and uh, with the instruments moving being totally 100% fluid and every member of that band should be really proud of how they played tonight and probably for the rest of the whole tour as well they did amazingly so how was Gregory Porter's performance it was simply flawless he was full of life and soul and you could hear all his emotions within the vocals and you can hear the enjoyment within his voice as well he enjoyed being on that stage and it came across with his vocals it came across with his stage presence and every time the audience cheered and applauded him at the end of the song and even during the songs as well just like just like lady blackbird you could see you could feel the happiness within him as he was getting that so much energy so much energy from the audience and from Gregory Porter and from his entire band and for me it was so refreshing to be able to listen to a show of this caliber as shows like this totally remind me of being back at sea in the theatre that I called home for three and a half years at least once a week I'd have a, uh, a show like this where you had everyone on stage all the orchestra just enjoying themselves as they played a favorite gig like this and Gregory Porter and his band they had that about them and it it's brilliant to hear this and it's also brilliant it's not just only not only to to hear it but to feel it as well and that's how it came across the audience fed off of all this happy energy and this energy was just raw and there was so much love within that room from listening to some excellent musicians playing and the flawless Gregory Porter singing in his style now for anyone that has bought a ticket for this for this tour and uh, listen to this podcast I have to say 
you've got a show that is absolutely value for money you've got everything and more than what you could expect in this show and it's an amazing show to watch and i am so privileged to see a show of this caliber i love shows like this and it's not often that i get to see a show that i can really really truly like and to, and i'm going to be honest here i've not heard much about gregory porter's work i saw him on uh, the to uh, on the 2021 Hooten and the end New Year's Eve celebration from Jules Holland and I thought yeah that's a, a guy to watch out for and I was not wrong I was not wrong Gregory Porter has got a lovely long career ahead of him that I guarantee and I was privileged to see his show live if you've enjoyed today's podcast, please hit like, subscribe and share. And if you haven't already done so, why not check out more content from Master X Media on our website. And that is www.masterxmedia.info. And I shall catch you next time. Bye for now.